Hello, I'm Etska, and welcome to another live stream. I have some of my Soviets to paint, and I have some brushes and paint, so that will all hopefully come together, and we'll get some models painted. Or at least that's the plan. I'm a little bit. Uh... Hello, Nicholas. How are you doing? I'm a little bit uh, disorganized at the moment. I've only actually just run up to start the stream, so uh, I might need to uh, just set some things up. I think I've got everything. Not only do I have the uh, anti-tank gun crew, which I want to get done. I'll show those off in a minute. I've got also a box of other Soviet models, so depending on how well um, I've started on some of them, uh, depending on how well we we do, we might get some of those done. Um, given my disorganization today, I find that unlikely. Although there is one thing I do want to show off. The uh, the tank that we built last week. The, uh, the T-34ZP. I'm, just before I paint it, I'm working on some tank riders. Which is a essentially just some soldiers that sit on the back of a tank. Every army did it to some extent, but the Russians kind of made particular use of it. And so I have put a magnet on the back of this one and a magnet hidden underneath the surface of the tank. And so this guy can happily sit while the uh, tank moves around. I want to make I'm not sure whether I'm going to make two or three, but just a couple, just a, just two or three, so that I can say, oh yeah, there's a squad riding on this tank. I think, as far as the rules, uh, Nicholas says, Soviets, eh, comrade? Da. Um, I'm not sure about the rules of bolt action in terms of how many are allowed to ride. I think it's the full squad of 12, uh, but I will have to check that. But these are essentially just going to be markers to say that the squad is on board, not necessarily representing every model specifically. Yes, uh, so, Bolt Action. I play Bolt Action. It's a historical war game, and I play Soviets because it just is the most interesting. I think, honestly, the one thing that, that drew me to the Soviets was probably this. Um... Oh hey, that's just a normal truck. Well, not when you put this on it. It's a Katusha. And it's really weird that this is the thing that made me want to play Soviets more than anything else. And I still haven't painted it. I've painted probably getting on for 100 Soviet models and I haven't painted the one that, that I really want to. Oh well. Maybe next week we can do the, uh, the Katusha. Get that out of the way. But let's put that out of the way. Open up the wet palette and let's see about uh, see about the anti-tank gun. So I've already painted the gun itself. Uh, this is a 3D printed uh, Ziz 3, and the files are just on Thingiverse. Which once the stream is done, I'll put the uh, the link to this in the uh, description. Assuming I remember, but I've forgotten to put it out there for the moment. Um, but this counts as medium anti-tank gun for the rules of the game. But what I haven't done, I haven't painted up the crew. So this guy is somewhat interesting because I've 3D printed a body so that I can use the spare plastic arms and heads from the plastic kit. Is a little thing that I've been working on recently. So. I imagine this is a uh, an NCO or some kind of bossy guy standing at the front shouting. We've got the gunner who's kind of slightly awkward but he does fit in quite nicely tucked into the equipment there. And then we have this guy with a shell to reload the thing. And so with my painting handle. Let's start with the NCO. Let's get some focus. That is a wonderful mold line. 
Look at that mold line all the way down that arm. Um, do I have a knife to hand? I think I do. My knife is underneath my keyboard. Of course it is. got it obviously it's quite visible because you can see through the uh... Nicholas asks any plans of giving the blood pact a video I kind of have um, some ideas I'm certainly not gonna build a whole army of them um, but I kind of like the idea of painting one blood pact, one son of sec, um, and like maybe I've got enough chaos models thrown together that I can make like a squad uh, or maybe a kill team. I've certainly got enough spare parts now for my uh, for for my imperial guard. If you've seen my last video, uh, last video or the video before, um, someone sent me an entire bag full of just bits for uh, imperial guard. So I've got plenty going around um, yeah um, so I could easily build a blood pact a son of sec I think the distinct parts of them like there's a lot of kind of generic chaos stuff where you can just take a Acadian and put some spikes on it but the real distinct parts are the um, for the blood pact, it would be like the grill, the the grotesque, and then for the sons of Sec, it would be having the the that the, they have um, taxidermied human hands that over their face, because that's part of the uh, the sons of Sec stuff, which is all very lovely. And I'm just going to see what I can do about recovering some of the stuff on my wet palette because I've got various uh, various colours. I've got an ochre. It's kind of quite thin. So if I can paint this down, we'll see how well it covers. <clears throat> yeah, that's glob globbing down. When it dries, we'll see how it looks. Um, I do actually have a stalk tank on the way. It's in epic scale, so it's absolutely tiny. Um, the the stalk tank would be Ferrazoka. <laughs> Nicholas says, I wish I had people send me bags of bits. Um, I think this is the... Well, it's the first time anyone sent me just a, a bag of, of random assorted stuff. Um, there's been a couple of times people have got me models. So, my Hark model, um, someone paid for that. Uh, Gaunt's Ghosts, the, the official plastic set, someone uh, paid for my or paid most of mine uh, for that. That's going down fairly well, actually. Even though the, even though it's quite thin, um, it's got some matte medium in it in in the mix, so that has helped it out, as matte medium is supposed to. Yeah, it's it. It's not much that I've got out of this channel. Um, I mainly do this for for fun, 
I, I enjoy painting and I enjoy kind of sharing my my stuff and I like doing it in video form. <laughs> so that notification was uh, Foxy Mitz, the chief researcher for the Autoredactus, uh, groaning at one of my jokes, which was absolutely brilliant. I think what I will do is just quickly adjust this camera down a bit because I tend to kind of, I'm down here when I'm painting and I fall off screen. Um, I do want a different shade for the trousers because I like to mix up the colors. So let's get a brown. Let's actually get a couple of different colors because we'll use them at different points. Was I, what was I saying? Was I saying something important? I assume I was not saying anything important because uh, very little of what I say is g actually genuinely properly important. Fun, maybe, but uh, not always important. That may be a little strong. This, this uh, light brown is very opaque. I was going to say I'll, I'll kind of do some shading with the lighter brown, but maybe what I'll do is actually mix in some of the ochre and, and highlight uh, the light brown with the ochre instead. Nicholas asks, what got you into Gaunt's Ghosts? Now that is a good question, and I'm not entirely certain. Um, I've always liked books. I've always read. The uh, bookcase in the background here it is just the short list of some of my favourites. Um, there's probably about 200 books there in my favourites list. And I have a bookcase downstairs that's probably three times the size of that with all of the books that I want to read. So reading books has always been a thing for me. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to get some of this ochre to actually make a highlight colour. But I'm ending up being very, very thin. Let's see if this doesn't pull. Uh, it's just about behaving. Uh, so, when I was playing Warhammer 40k, when I was playing Orcs mainly, uh, a friend of mine had Imperial Guard, and he had uh, he played Catechins. Um, this is third edition, and the only plastic set for um, the Imperial Guard at the time was Catechins. This is just before the Cadian kit came out. And I saw some stuff about the Tanner of Thurston only. It's like, ah, oh, some guys in the woods. Well, that just sounds like knockoff Catechins. Not really interested in that. I play Orcs. I don't care about the humans. And I didn't really give it much thought. I suspect that that was probably the second book. So that was Ghostmaker. <laughs> Probably. Then a little time later, when I had a subscription for White Dwarf and I was getting every single White Dwarf and paying the exorbitant fee that comes with that. Um, on the front cover of a uh, particular issue of White Dwarf came a free sample booklet. And the sample booklet had um, three 
X scripts from the first three books. And this is the release of Necropolis, the third book. So however however long between the second and third book, that's how long this story goes on for. Although it's mostly me just ignoring it. And from the from that, because I like reading and hey, I've just been given the free version of this uh, this story. I read it, because of course I did. Took all of an afternoon. And Dan Abnett's writing is absolutely excellent. Have we just had the same song three times in a row? Am I on repeat? No. Okay. And because of this booklet, I bought the first, second, and third books. At the same time, I walked out of the Games Workshop shop with all three of these. And the rest is history. I've been hooked ever since. So, it is kind of that... Um, That sampler book, a booklet, would be uh, the cause of my interest, or kind of the first point that actually got me interested in the Gods Ghosts. So I think a lot of people uh, considered Gods Ghosts to just be knockoff catagens. I think that was a common criticism at the time, and. They're really not. That there's a, there's very little relationship between the catechins, their, their their attitudes, their style of fighting, and the uh, uh, the ghosts. Obviously, there are some similarities. There are imperial guard regiments. There are uh, they have expert stealth and so on and so forth. But that's sort of where the similarities end, because the way that they co go about combat is quite different. Particularly, the Catechins favour overwhelming firepower, particularly at close range, whereas the Tanith favour um, continuing stealth tactics through an engagement. That's at least some amount of uh, highlighted shadow. It's not a lot. <laughs> Nicholas says they're Irish catechin knockoffs. Well, yes, they're, they're the they're the catechins you bought off Wish. <laughs> the one thing I really wanted to do, and I've never got around to it. Um, is to actually read the Sharps novels. Because there's a lot of the fans of Gaunt's Ghosts who have read um, uh, Sharps, Sharps Rifles, uh, or the Sharps series. And I think Dan Abnett has confirmed that there is some amount of inspiration in there. Although not. Not just a total ripoff. It is, it is, it is its own story. But there's little nods here and there to, uh, to the Sharp series. And I've heard a lot of people say that the the style of writing, the humour, um, and that kind of thing, uh, there are similarities between them. And generally, what I've heard is if you like one you will almost certainly like the other. Now I have played, played, watched, I have watched all of the Sharps films. Um, I watched them all exactly once and I have not been back to watch them a second time yet, but I enjoyed them and I will at some point go back and watch them again because, because I enjoyed them. Uh, 
but I want to read the books. Just because I like books, as I've mentioned already. Minus the chemical burns from the plastic. What chemical burns? Chemical burns? Chemical burns. I don't even mean by chemical burns. Where does that sash go? We've got this um, belt kind of braids going across his chest and it disappears under his collar about here. But then, where's, I don't think it's modeled on the back. So I'm just gonna cheat and paint in where it should be. see it at all. Hmm. Interesting. This is uh, one of the options I've had for 3D printing um, bodies. Oh yeah, for, for chemical burns from stuff from which. Okay. Oh, wasn't that the um, the shampoo that turned out to be like some kind of exfoliant acid and you're supposed to like wash your hands in it for like five or ten seconds and if you put it in the shampoo you have it on your head for much longer than that is that right not sure if that's right um yeah so this is one of the options i had for 3d printing the bodies to go with the uh, uh the plastic arms with any plastic kit, you have cool options for different arms, and that's great. I like having options. But I think that having a few more bodies means that I can use up some of this bare arms and get some useful poses out of them still. And this one has some of those spare arms and a spare plastic head, but the body and the legs are 3D printed. Shampoo earrings and the infamous sandals. Well, they're not infamous because I haven't heard of them. I'm sure they're infamous to other people. I don't think I've ever... No, I, I, I've bought stuff off of AliExpress. I haven't bought stuff off of Wish. So I'm probably fairly safe in that regard. Uh... Although that said, I've got some very disappointing things off of uh, off of eBay in my time, such as if you can't quite see it on on screen, such as this little flare pistol, which is um, a spring mechanism that that does that, and then it's got a little plate in the front, and it shoots. These little plastic like army men on a parachute thing and they go all of three meters like a child could throw it further I need some more black for these boots it, it doesn't really look the part it doesn't function very well um, it's horribly flimsy and it's not even very powerful it has nearly no redeeming qualities. Okay, I did not water down this new paint. There we go. There we go. Getting these boots done. Hello, 40k guy. How are you doing? Got confused at the moment, thinking that was uh, that was two separate comments. 
Is that hello, Ed, or is that hello, Ed? <laughs> I am I am doing okay. I think I've recovered from my uh, disorganisation earlier today. Um, I've had all of not very much to do, and then all of a sudden everything needed to happen at once, which is uh, annoying. But I managed it, and I've. I got the stream started on time. I just had to natter for a bit while I sorted everything out. Right, I need to get a base coat for the skin down. Because uh, that goes down before the wash and then highlights come afterwards. So I need... Did I not get the tan out? I did not get the tan out. Sand, not tan. I always call it tan, but it is in fact. It says sand. Sand. Ah. Happy being old day. To a 40k guy who is going to be older tomorrow than he is today. Which is sort of something you can say about any day, but particularly on your birthday. I never keep track of my birthdays or my age, and so I'm just perpetually in a, in a state of am older than I have ever been before. But there's no... Uh, no track of it. This is my theme song, yes. Um, this is Invisible by Vibe Tracks, and it's on the YouTube library. Uh, well, I mean, it's also on, in various YouTube videos, uh, but specifically it's in the YouTube library as being available for anyone to use in their videos uh, without copyright. Um, and it's probably my favorite. It's like a nice birthday armored sentinel. Right, okay. Does the Sentinel have um, a machine spirit? I thought the, sen the Sentinel was a, um, a directly controlled machine. Oh well, there's different types of machine spirit. There's the whole, like even a last gun and a bolt gun have a machine spirit, but they don't. Um, and then there's the more complex machinery that has a computer system running it, and then that computer system is called an, um, a machine spirit, so I might be just getting mixed up between those two. This is the machine spirit why you have not praised the Omosaya recently. Omosaya. Om Omosaya? I still think it should be, pr it should be spelled O-H-M. Asaya. Ohm Asaya, because resistance is futile. Alright, 
I'm going to put away the good brush and get out my old good brush and do a wash. And this is my homemade brown wash, or at least I think it's brown. Dark brown, yes. My, uh, my label uh, has worn away, so I can only tell uh, which one it is by the indentations that the pen made when I wrote D A R K B R O W M. Looks correct when you see it, not when you say it. Yeah, it's supposed to be om omnis om om omisaya. Ominousaya. But I think it should be om asaya because that's more funny. Right. Douse the thing in brown wash and pretend that I've put all the effort into painting it properly. Hello, Timothy. What kind of glue do you use for modeling? I have several different types of glue that I use for different applications. Um, primarily, if I'm making a plastic kit, I have Ravel's Contact Polystyrene Cement, um, which is a very thick polystyrene cement, and I much prefer that to the thinner stuff and I know other people prefer the thinner stuff and that's absolutely fine whichever works for you uh, but this uh, Ravel like thick stuff in the tube is my favorite polystyrene cement however being polystyrene cement it only works on polystyrene surprisingly enough and the common plastic kits are polystyrene so that helps but it doesn't work on resin or metal models, um, or vinyl, uh, a different type of plastic, polyvinyl models. And so for those, I use the absolute cheapest super glue. Uh, this is the stuff from Poundland, and you get seven packs, uh, seven tubes of this in a pack. And this is absolutely terrible, but then all super glue is terrible. I have never found a super glue to work particularly well, and so I may as well buy the cheapest one. And alongside, uh, alongside that, I have baking powder, and baking powder works as an excellent um, accelerant for super glue. I have used water, but it's not as consistent. Um, sometimes you can wash away some of the super glue. With the with water before it starts to set, whereas baking powder it will just sit on top. Um, so for in fact for this very model, uh, it's got a plastic arm and a three D printed resin three D printed body, and so this join here was done with super glue, and there was a crack in the uh, the the print so right here. That was a chunk that was missing off of the uh, off of the 3D print, and so I just dotted in a little bit of super glue. I glued on the arm, added an extra bit of super glue into that hole, and then poured baking powder over the top, and that formed uh, like that shape, and it, it built it up. It is slightly a rough texture here, but then there's also rough texture here from the 3D printed supports that I didn't clean up properly. Um, this is not meant to be a display model or anything, so if I was, if I wanted this to look nicer, I'd, I'd spend more time cleaning that up. But as this is uh, for my Soviet army, which I'm essentially speed painting the entire army, I don't mind the imperfections here and there because every model has the, has some imperfections. Nicholas asks, what's Pamland? Uh, it's not Pamland, it is Poundland. I live in the UK. Our currency is the pound. 
the Great British Pound, Pound Sterling. Um, and so we have Poundland. I think you're in America, which means you would use the um, the American dollar as your currency, and so you would have Dollar Land, Dollar World, Dollar Tree. Dollar Tree sounds right. I've heard people talk about Dollar Tree. Um, right. For the time being, I'm going to put this one aside for the wash to dry. Oh, there's a gap on his boot. I've just seen that. I'll just grab that before... Uh, There we go. Right. And let's move on to the next guy. Uh, 40k guy says it's a balance between thick and thin. That is about the polystyrene cement. Yes. Um, it, it's about it's about preference. Like you can have thick or thin and achieve the same end result. Or you can achieve different end results just in a different style uh, with the different stuff. Um, neither is better or worse. It's just a case of whichever one you prefer to use or whichever one's going to give you the right effect. I generally prefer to use the thicker stuff. Um, so for this one, this is the gunner for the anti-tank gun. So he's not actually armed directly, but he's got these great big mittens on and a great coat. So he's feeling cold. He's put everything on to warm himself up. Um, this is basically going to be one solid colour for the coat and then a few details for the gloves, the pouches, the, the Ushanka hat. Yeah, Dollar Tree. Yeah. Uh, I assume there are other variants in other, in other places. There'll, there'll be a a euro shop. There'll be a, a yen land. There'll be a, a, a peso peso palace. Oh god, that sounds horrible. <laughs> and and every other currency. I can't think of. I don't know that many currencies, so I'll probably stop there. So I'm just mixing in some of my ochre with some green that I've got on the palette, and we'll see what kind of color that gets us that ah, I like that that's going to come out well after the wash I think I don't think it's uh, something I would use without the brown wash because I'm, I'm dousing the whole army in brown wash that's actually a good point I need to make some more I think mm, maybe not maybe, maybe it'll last this army but I'll need to make, make some afterwards So I think this model is 100% um, Warlord Games plastic model. So there's no extras 3D printed or, or anything like that. I think the, yeah. So there's some, just some marks around the, the wrist. So I've definitely cut the, cut the hands off and repositioned them. Because uh, these hands are probably intended to be Holding a rifle or, or uh, something like that, rifle or submachine gun. So I've just ever so slightly modified it to uh, uh, to have him rested up against the the anti tank gun. Uh, remind me when I finish painting this one, and I'll actually show how it fits against the uh, against the gun. Although it's not a perfect fit, given that it, this is not intended, this kit's not intended to be used this way. Um, for the sake of a few minutes with a, a knife and some poly cement, I think it's, uh, it's pretty good. It works. So as I'm getting different mixes off of the wet palette, I'm kind of aiming in different parts of the model. So if I'm getting a little bit more green, the mix gets a little darker. 
And so I'm going underneath these folds. And that's kind of giving me some, some shading there for very little like actual thinking. And then when I bring in some more of the ochre, because I need some more paint, this is obviously going to be a lighter mix. So I can go on top surfaces and have effectively a highlight. I usually spend a lot longer um, making sure my mix was correct, but as I've mentioned, speed painted, kind of messy, it goes, it's fine, army. Not winning any painting competitions off of this one. Although saying that, just for fun, I have actually entered some of my Soviets into a painting competition. <laughs> they did not place. You will not be surprised to learn that they did not place. That's annoying. The back of the coat is visible through the middle of the model, which I'm pretty sure will not be visible when the model is all glued together. But uh, I'll at least try and get some green on it. All right, so that's the great coat done with my uh, simple shading in place. So let's find some interesting colors for the rest of the model. The uh, gloves. Is that a piece of, that is a piece of uh, polystyrene cement, like a little lump. Hmm. Or oh, that might be when I test fitted it against the gun with some, uh, some, some poly cement. Given that the, the the gun is actually uh, 3D printed in resin, so the polystyrene won't stick, but it's still sticky, and so you can lean things up against each other and have them stay in place, but then they'll very easily come apart when you pull on them. Let's go for more of a brown for the uh, the gloves. Or mittens, because there's no individual fingers on here. Uh, way too much water on the brush. There we go. That's better. And that sounds like the security dog next door barking really loudly. Apologies if you can hear a dog barking in the background. The, uh, the dog is a security dog and is trained to bark at odd noises and odd smells and so on and so forth. And when it's off duty, it doesn't know that it's off duty. And so it barks at everything. It's fine, it's, it's perfectly uh, happy and well looked after. Can I get? I've lost my focus. There we go. Um, yeah, it's perfectly happy and well looked after. It's just loud. All right, well, let's get the belts. There's my dark brown. There it is. Let's get the belts done.
Is anyone else in the chat painting or model building? I haven't got a, uh, a specific topic of discussion, so we can kind of go off in any direction. Should we do the Usanka quite dark? I think we shall. Yeah, let's let's do let's do a fairly dark Ushanka for this one. Um, let's mix some of the ochre with the dark brown. I'm mainly kind of using up the ochre for everything just because I've got a massive blob of ochre on my wet palette. So I want to use it up the uh, another model I'm working on at the moment, a uh, stalk tank. For the Tanith first and only to fight, although it's in the wrong scale, but yeah, sure, shit's sure, fine. Um, do I have that here? I'm not sure. I'll have to check to see if I've got that. But that was. Uh, I think they appear multiple times in different books, but they first appeared in. Uh, from the Ferrozoicans in book three. That's Necropolis. So Nicholas asks, did I ever play Warhammer Fantasy? Sort of? It's it's one of those things where if, if you go into to Games Workshop games, they'll try and make you go to other Games Workshop games. And until you break free of the Games Workshop cycle, you end up just going between the Games Workshop games, and that's kind of a bit dull. But before I had broken free, I did play Warhammer Fantasy for a little bit. Um, I played Bretonians. And I deliberately picked Bretonians because I didn't want to have another Horde army. So for 40k I have Orcs, and I played an Infantry Orc army which was probably the best way to play Orcs back then. Strangely, not anymore. Orcs are very... Um, like, they're much more shooting army, which kind of doesn't make much sense to me. Um, from lore terms, but sure, whatever. As long as, it, as long as it's fun to play. Which it isn't, because 40k isn't fun to play. What am I talking about? <clears throat> oh yeah, Bretonians. So I play 40k Orcs with an infantry army, and so I wanted to play a m minimum model count because I wanted to play in a different way. It wasn't about like, I don't want to paint loads of models. I kind of do, I like painting models, but I wanted to play in a different way. So I picked Bretonians as the humble Bretonian knight is the um, kind of the most expensive standard troops choice or a core choice is, is how Warhammer Fantasy worked back then. Um, and so I went with Bretonians just because it would be a different way of playing. And so what I did with my Bretonians, definitely not playing a Horde army, is I turned it into a Horde army. And I ended up fielding in, in a thousand points, I would field two units of knights, one character, and then four units of uh, of, of, of peasants. Um, so yeah, I had more models than anyone else, again, in my not horde army, horde army. <laughs> and then when I came back to 40k, well, when I came back to mini painting, I did not come back to 40k. Uh, but when I came back to mini painting, I find out that, that they've done away with the Bretonians. That is too much. Too much wash on his face. There's there's always these allegations that, oh, wait, Bretonians are coming back. Oh, you can still play them in Legends. And that there's this, this old world thing coming soon. And I don't care. <laughs> Just don't care. It's fine. 
I'll keep hold of some of the Bretonians just for uh, um, just in case I ever need a, a knight in shining armor for a roleplay game or some other fantasy setting. Um, the muddy peasants can be a town militia or a band of ne'er do wells. Hmm. Haven't really got his arms very well. I did uh, end up with some some models that someone else dumped on me when they went off to university. Um, I don't know what happened to their army, but they had an Eldar army and they had an Elves uh, Eldar 40k and Elves Warhammer Fantasy, um, and they dumped a lot of the stuff on me, but. It wasn't complete armies, and I know they had a complete army, so I'm not sure if they just dumped the spares on me, or, or if they sold a lot of it and then dumped the remainder on me. Um, but anyway, I've ended up with quite a few um, High Elves, Wood Elves, and Eldar, 40k Eldar, uh, that I painted up many years ago. And so if ever I need a an Eldar or an elf in heavy armor or an elven mage if someone wants to play that for a, a roleplay game then uh, I can just be like here you go there's a model use that so I said I would show how this fits let's, uh, let's focus for this well, so this guy is going to be taken off of the, the little disc base and he's going to be glued into place uh, just like this, kind of right up against the, uh, the, the the recoil support here, and then this guy will keep will stay on his disc base, and he will go kind of here, something like there. And when I do the texture paste, I'll actually put the base, or I'll, I'll probably use a spare base. I'll put a base wrapped in cling film and press it down. So that they're in the texture paste, there's an impression of a 25 mil disc, so that he can just kind of slot in and be removed. Uh, the officer or the NCO will be at the front, standing in front of the re the uh, armored shield because he's an idiot. The, it does need a crew of four, and I do have enough space for a fourth member, but I haven't actually built the fourth member yet. I haven't decided whether that's going to be another guy carrying a shell or maybe carrying a box. Uh, or just um, a uh, a guard standing by with a with a carbine kind of thing. But that's it's coming along nicely. I think the uh, this guy's green coat kind of works well with the uh, with the gun. <laughs> right for the loader. Just have, have a drink. Hell hi, Jura. Everyone in the, uh, the the chat better be drinking some water. Or some uh, other drink that uh, will hydrate you. I have some water here as well, actually. There you go. Cheers. <clears throat> right, where should we go with this one? Um, some variant of brown, most likely. But here we have the um, the quilted uniform. I actually have a way that I like to do these. So let's go back to the, the nice brush. Because one way I can, I can do these in a almost completely lazy way is to grab a fairly light color and then stripe in like that 
but not coating the whole surface. Can you see that? There we go. So I haven't coated the whole of this uh, this surface. I've left the edges. And then when it uh, when the wash goes on, we'll have this not so much gradient, but just a a fairly stark contrast in color between what will be a fairly dark recess where the wash goes in to a very to a fairly bright highlight where it's just uh, kind of on the corners to then a much more solid color in between where I'm painting in the dark brown currently. I've done a few in, in that kind of style. Um, and kind of, it kind of works, I kind of like it. When I first got these, uh, the, the Soviets infantry, I didn't really like the, uh, the quilted uniform, but it, it's, it's grown on me. I quite like it. Oh, especially if you like the, um, am I drifting off frame? There we go. Especially if you like the, uh, the old, the old propaganda, the old, uh, rumors and stories that the soldiers would tell each other um the idea that if you wore two quilted jackets like just one on top of the other that it would su suddenly become bulletproof <laughs> which uh, has been proven to not be true uh, but yeah there's a lot of myth and legend around the quilted uniform um, it was very popular for for just being warm, but also can we can we get focus? There we go. Um, but also actually genuinely being um, for being very good. same for the the jacket now I've gone for a slightly lighter color here just because I like to introduce as much variance as I can I'm wondering if some of the myths, or, or not necessarily myths, but the misunderstandings that, that then turn into myths about the quilted uniform come from uh, Gambeson armor. And for those that don't know, Gambeson is um, a linen armor that was used in medieval times um, and before and was surprisingly effective at um, defending against both slashing and piercing attacks so sword slashes and sword thrusts but also arrow hits um, somewhat also effective against um, axe hits but then you also have the, the the blunt impact component of that which is yeah you still get some padding against it so if I was gonna get hit with an axe and I had the opportunity of putting on a gambus and I would but also try to not get hit by an axe because generally that's uh, unpleasant some awkward awkward angles to get in on this jacket now it's all kind of hidden away behind the arms and going back to the whole this army is speed painting so I'm not I care too much 
but I at least want to give it a go. Yeah. Got most of it. That's good. Carrick says hello. Hello, Carrick. And that painting handle is Ace. It is. Um, it is my own design. I am currently working on some final iterations before I put it up for sale. Um, yes. Eventually, we'll get you on. I need to work out how to uh, license production of this because I, I kind of haven't gone that far because um, I haven't got the opportunity, I haven't had the opportunity to test print it. Yes, yes, I know. I know who you is. In fact, I know you as Carrick more than I know you as Ian. Because your screen name is Ian, is Carrick on everything and never Ian. And so I have no idea who this Ian is. Who is this Ian? Uh. See, when I started the boots here, I mixed in something with my light brown. And I can't remember what it was. I think it might have been the sand. Yeah, I think it was. But I didn't keep track of... Uh... Uh, which one it was, so... Yeah. Yeah, that looks close enough. It is a good point. This is why I always have the same um, screen name on everything. Like, as far as the internet is aware, like, I am the, sa I'm the same name everywhere. I, I use this name more than my birth name, to the point where I could legitimately change my name uh, with Depol without going through the, the extended process of, like, have you ever used this name before? Well, yes, I have. Here is 20 years worth of evidence of me using Edgar as my name. <laughs> remember meeting up with World of Warcraft people in real life and was very odd referring to people by their normie names yeah this is why I don't do that I, I, I always I always just stick with my uh, my screen name because I don't associate with my um, my legal name my, my birth name alright backpack the uh, the rucksack, which is literally just a sack tied at the top and, and some straps. It's great. Let's go slightly darker again. Let's mix in some black with. Let's mix in some black with the ochre and see what that does. Well, that's gone grey. That's like a charcoal grey. That's very interesting that it's done that. So that's a mix of ochre and black. Has has come up with this. <laughs> Need to start painting Deathcore of Krieg, but don't want to balls up the full of this. You know the thing about resin models is that if you paint them and you don't like it, you can just brush them in acetone for like 30 seconds. And start again. Well, you, you want to dry them off, but then you can reprime. They're also not heroic scale. Yes, they are. Forge World uh, is not true scale. Um, it is closer to true scale than than their their plastic the Citadel plastic kits, but they're not actually true scale. Not by quite a long way.
can get the... Um... Who was it that did the comparison? There was someone who did the comparison of the Death Core. They had the, the Citadel plastic ones from um, Octarius. Then they had the, um, the Forge World ones. And then they had a 1 to 40... No, 1 to 56. A 1 to 56 scale. Um, true scale human model from a, a railway set. And the railway set one is a... I mean, it's a scale model. It's not going to be perfectly accurate. But it's a very accurate representation of a human at that size. And the Death Corps of Krieg are... The head's a little bit bigger. The facial features are a little bit bigger. The hands are bigger. It's not nearly as much as the Octarius set. Which are very heavy on the hero scale. But... Um, it is still hero scale because it's not true scale. I think the best way to understand it is um, it's like a, a the old volume controls. If you ever remember those analog volume controls where you had off and then you'd click it on and you'd have basically no volume and then you go all the way up the volume. Well, you have all of that volume is hero scale, and then the click, the off, is an absolute, and that's your true scale. It's the same thing with people talking about the true scale Space Marines. And I have yet, I've seen one person making a Space Marine that is actually a. a truly scaled because they've done a lot of work changing the proportions of the model to make it um, basically they've, they've used the same face and hands but they've made the the stature much taller so proportionally the head is smaller even though it's the same the same head which brings it closer to, to true scale I don't think it's a perfect representation but given like they're modifying an official kit that they're not like starting from scratch and, and like sculpting or 3D printing it. Uh, I think they've done a very good job. But a lot of people that are saying, oh yeah, <laughs> you literally couldn't get into Terminator armor, says Carrick. <laughs> yes. Actually, it was, a ter it was a Terminator, yeah. Um, so, so one of the things about the about this particular true scale um, space marine was that it is a uh, th is that it is a Terminator model specifically, and one of the things they did was they moved that they like kept the head and like the like the armored hood, but then they moved that up and kept, uh, and positioned the head and the shoulders proportionately co correctly rather than having the head sticking out of his sternum. I'll have to mention that on the next episode of Back to the Brush. Uh, we've actually got quite a few topics that we want to talk about this time around. So I'm not sure if that's going to be a headliner. Um, uh, worth a try. It's, it's on the list. And for anyone who's wondering why I'm painting the ammunition here brown, uh, I will be painting, I have been painting this entire army with non-metallic metals, which is, which is a decision that I made for some reason. Now for a lot of the models in the army, it's like trivially simple. Uh, do I have, I'm reaching around all the wiring and this is dangerous. Um. Yeah, here we go. So for most of the army, all of your non-metallic metal is like the gun barrel and the magazine and that's it. 
this guy's got a second magazine in his hand but that that's it so there's really not much to do and yes i know it's painted quite light but i'm doing snow bases so it should hopefully kind of help that out um and then some of the gun crew particularly there's no metal on these models this is uh, one that i've painted previously and this is the one i did or that i'm still doing haven't done the skin um but then every now and again there's something interesting like this is a brass shell casing so i need to paint non-metallic brass which is interesting are we ready for the wash on this one no we're not we need to do the i actually miss, missed some of the rucksack straps because there's this one and i assume yep there's one on the other side Yep, okay. And more importantly, the belt, which I haven't done at all. If you notice on the uh, blue tack, this line here that's been gouged into the blue tack all of the way around, that's because when I position it like this and rotate it, I end up squeezing the, uh, the, the blue tack up. And then the other time is uh, I'll lock it into place here and then hold my thumb down on it. I find this to be particularly comfortable, but uh, you will notice where if you if you kind of watch me for more than a few minutes, uh, given that this live stream is now an hour old, you probably have um, that I constantly move it, and I always want to get just the right angle for for any given brush stroke. And it's partly to do with comfort, but it's partly to do with having the right angle to get at everything just as neatly as you can. And you don't need this. You don't, you don't need to be able to do that. You can come in from slightly different angles and be perfectly fine. But I, I design mechanical things and I have 3D printers. So... I may, may as well make something for myself to do exactly what I wanted to do. Right, question here is, do I even bother to try and get in at this pouch? There, there is a pouch underneath the arm here. And, and I've got to get in right in there to get to it. Let's at least try. If I can't get to it, I don't care. Probably this angle is going to be the easiest. Yeah, close enough. That's most of it. And yep, I think we're now ready for the all over brown wash. I need to put, right, that's black. I'm gonna put the black away. Uh, which bit would annoy you? Sorry, I've, I've forgotten what I was talking about with the conversation. I do this a lot. There's actually quite a bit of wash left on my wet palette, so I might just grab, grab what's there. Kind of these two blobs here. See if it goes the whole way, it might not. Mm, saying that, my little technique that I was talking about earlier for the uh, quilted uniform does require a fairly heavy application of wash. No pouch, ah, yeah. Not painting the pouch would uh, would be annoying. 
given that this army is painted on the uh, the, the arm's length uh, concept, that this is a gaming army, not a looking good army. I kind of don't mind this kind of thing. I'm at least gonna try, but I'm not gonna stress about reaching into the to the bits. And that's uh, that's a healthy uh, thing to come across every now and again. Is um, for for this particular model, I want it to look the absolute best it possibly can. And then for this other model, I don't really care. I just want it kind of painted, just painted at, at any level. And that is what the, I mean, that's what the Gaunt's Ghosts are turning into at the moment. Um, I, I'm, I'm kind of speed painting through a lot of them. And the Soviets were, from the, from the onset, they were intended to be a speed painted army. And so I'm spending more time on other models. Uh, and so the cowboys that I painted recently, I think I only painted two. Of, was it two of those I painted on live stream? I think it was. But I've spent a lot more time painting them than I have painting. Uh, uh, any given Soviet or, or Tanith. And for anyone who saw my community tab post yesterday, mentioning that I uh, I missed the stream yesterday because I was playing Dead Man's Hand which is a very fun game and it works on an interesting system of uh, of um, activation, so rather than the the old-fashioned kind of player A takes all of their characters' moves, player B takes all of their characters' moves, and then you repeat. Um, a lot of games these days use some form of random, uh, well, so sometimes more organized, sometimes more random um, alternate activation. And Dead, Man, Dead Man's Hand does it in a very interesting way. With that, you take um, a, one suit of cards for a small game, two suits for a bigger game, and you shuffle them, and then you deal out one card to each of your models, and the opponent does the same. And when you turn them over, you go from high to low. So Joker, Ace, and then King, Queen, Jack, 10, 9, 8, and so on. Uh, and so each model is randomly uh, placed in the turn order. So there can be times when, ah oh yes, I, I have three of my models that are going in a row, but there's a lot of times where I get one model and the opponent gets one or maybe two, and then I get two, and then the opponent gets one. Okay, so we're back to the beginning with our officer chap, who is kind of good enough. Not great, but it's good enough. But I want to get some details on the face. So, with a Caucasian skin tone paint. Well, let's do some of that. Did I base coat his skin ochre or tan? Hmm. 
I'm going to guess at Tam. We'll see how that goes. Yeah, that works. See how many layers we'll do for the skin. Probably not too many, but we'll give it a few. First one's a fairly light mix, so we've got more tan than we've got of the Caucasian skin tone. at least to start. Well the camera seems to think it's a face already so that's good. But then the uh, the camera does tend to pick up faces where there aren't any so that's not necessarily a good indication. I really need to delete this song from uh, from my computer because I don't like it. And I've never used it in a video. Or at least I hope I haven't. It's awful. Um, and it only ever pops up in the live stream. Because for the live stream I just select all, drag into VLC and play. This bit's fine. It's just the air horns are just because it plays out of like it flips between left and right audio track for anyone who's uh, got audio got, um, stereo audio. You kind of hear that, and it's really annoying. skip a step on the skin and go for a much harsher uh, mix of skin tone and probably this will be it for the hands and then I'll do an extra one on the face. Probably 
good enough. There are some very fine details to do. So I shall need some red for the red star on his cap. Kind of, uh, I've kept a lot of the eyeballs on this army because, as I say, speed paints. It only has to look good from uh, from a meter away. You can't see an eyeball from that far away. Good practice. And I, I do need my practice with eyeballs. is proven by these kind of slightly messy um, whites. Let, let's go on. Just dots of pupils. Let's not totally mess this up. totally messed up, it's just completely rubbish. Yes, 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 we know. Bug, bug, bug. One thing I need to create that I have not done yet is an angled like rest for um, my kitchen paper. So I have a piece of kitchen paper with me whenever I'm painting. Here it is. And whenever I uh, wash the brush, I will kind of dry it off, but then I will have right here, can you see that kind of bump there? That is water. And so whenever I uh, rinse off the brush and then dry the brush, I have this droplet of water that, that kind of sits there and then eventually it will seep into the bristles, yep, yeah, there it goes. And now my brush is wet again. And so what I want is some kind of stand, like something like that, so that I can wash off the brush, dry it, run it across there, possibly even in one motion just like that, because that will then dry off the ferrule and the bristles. But that's just me thinking about it too hard, isn't it? Well, there we go. He's got a wonky eyeball. Um, but otherwise, 
it's kind of done. I could do some some more work on the uh, binoculars. I haven't got any of my greys out yet. I said that I don't have greys out and then I realise huh, I don't need grey. I've got black and white. That is actually a um, kind of a challenge that I've been wanting to do. Well, not really challenge, but just an experiment more more than anything else. Uh, is to paint a model using only black and white. So it's all about the the, the light values and shadow and and so on, and it it. it doesn't rely on colors being good or bad. Uh, but I sort of want the model to warrant that kind of... I don't just want to pick a random model and paint it in black and white. I, I want the model itself to pick... Uh, uh, to, like, the model itself to actually warrant the uh, uh, that style. So I'm thinking, like... A film noir character would be kind of the first thing that pops into my head but there's a lot of other things that might work Carrick says some of my north friends were talking about having a go at bolt action is that north as in from to north or is that north as in a misspelling of nerf or is it both because you can have north as from up nerf And we all know the Grim Up North. Grim Up North. Yeah, he'll do. Um, I highly recommend giving Bolt Action a go. Um, if you can borrow an army, or if someone lets you play with a uh, with your Death Core army as. Uh, Uh, as a particular army for, from f from World War Two, the way that uh, that is exactly what I mean. That has too much water in that brush. Um, because of the way bolt action works. Sort of any human with a rifle is essentially equivalent to any other human with a rifle. The assumption is that like everyone's trained in how to shoot a gun. And the differences between veteran and inexperienced troops are in their morale. And so it doesn't really matter. You can throw in a 40k army or um, a pike and shot, take out the uh, the musketeers, and it'll be fine. I mean, saying that, I would also play with just discs. Y yeah, maybe not using the Krieg as Germans, because that's a bit on the nose. Um... Yeah, like if I had any Krieg, I'd be painting them up as the French, because to me, firstly, that looks like the, the the uniform of the French army, and that like that nice proud blue uh, would be fun, would be nice to paint. But also, yeah, painting uh, painting Germans. Painting them in a historical setting and understanding and in a grown-up way is fine, but there are some people who definitely aren't doing it in an appropriate way.
So given that this model is going to have his face right up to the breech of this cannon, as long as I don't knock the other models into the... You kind of... You kind of can't see its face. You kind of see it from this angle a little bit. Where's my focal range? There it is. That's all you're ever going to see. So I'm probably going to do a little bit more on this cheek and then and then that'll be it. Kind of the same with the NMM. I'm, I'm doing a fairly fairly pale skin on, on everyone. I don't even have to be that consistent because the the armies of the Soviet Union were well, a union of multiple countries. So you can have um, Urals all the way down to uh, Cos uh, Cossacks uh, that's not what I was thinking of Kazakhstan uh, Kazakhs um, Slovaks Urals all sorts mixed together and so there's a lot of different it's all kind of pale Caucasian skin tones but there's a lot of variation in it and so uh, that gives you kind of the opportunity to just not care too much about the skin tone. I think that's all I'm doing for this guy because he does have his face in the breech of that gun. I'm not going to paint the eyes. Kind of, you're only ever going to see it from this angle. And this model is going to be uh, the one that's permanently glued to the gun. <clears throat> so he's going to be... Actually, I can take him off the base now. Can I take him off the base? There we go. So he goes in like this. And because he's permanently glued into place, he will never be removed and viewed from other angles. The other models will stay on their separate bases because these guys are the kind of wounds, sort of, in, in, in terms of how the game is played. So let's go for the loader. And then we just need to do the skin, which is the easy bit. I'll get the, uh, the red star first. Uh, we've got the skin, which is the easy bit, but then we have that non-metallic metal for this shell casing and I've not done non-metallic metal brass that's not true I have because I've done my light anti-tank gun had the same kind of thing uh, brass shell casing for the loader um, but I've forgotten how to do that and so I'm gonna have to make it up again I know the principles of, uh, of non-metallic metal Yeah, it's a shell. He's a loader for the anti-tank gun. What did you think it was? It's a stick. No, you know what's a stick? Th this one's a stick. That's a stick. Uh, this is something that... Uh, this video will be out tomorrow. I think I'm. Uh, this is going to be my Wednesday video. Because... I'm not as interested in this. Uh, this is the Soldiers Against Humanity. Soldiers of Humanity, sorry, not Against Humanity. Soldiers of Humanity, or Soldiers of Humankind. They're running a Kickstarter for STLs. And they released this as a sample. And it's got a cloak, so it's obviously useful for Tanith. But the, um, the style of it, I'm just not a fan of. Like the, the the legs are a little bit off proportion, and the hands and the arms are a little bit off proportion from what 
kind of from what I prefer. I don't think it's it's bad, it's just not what I like. The cloaks, on the other hand, the cloaks are pretty good. I do like the cloaks. Um, but what I don't know about these is can you do them as um, mul like multi-part kits? They are being released in separate pieces so that you can kit bash them within the set. But I don't know if they're going to be kit bashable with official Games Workshop models. And given that I'm trying to keep my army 70%, that might not be that might not be that useful for me. If I could have just the torso and the cloak with holes to put in catachin arms and then the catching head and, and legs, that'd be great. But I don't know if that's true. Lead researcher, lead researcher for the Order of Redactors, Foxy Mitz, has turned up in chat and is already harassing other members of the chat. So be on your best behaviour or you shall be banned in short order. We haven't had to ban anyone but bots yet, so that's good. Anyway, everyone have a drink of water. Stay hydrated. And so on and so forth. We have about a quarter of an hour left of the stream. I've got to do this guy's face and the non-metallic metal on that shell. So let's get stuck in to that. You, you know how when a certain kid is just always say is always in trouble and then they say oh they started it and you just know it's not true and even if it is true it's probably not true <laughs> yeah that that's what that seems like that that's that's how uh, that's how I'm reading that and, uh, and Carrick then says, Beep boop, I'm a bot. Just tempting fate. I mean, we could ban you just to see if... Uh, to see what happens. And Foxy Mitz, add it with the savage comments, says to Carrick, you would talk less garbage if you were a bot. There's a fight brewing. And the next session we have of uh, Call of Cthulhu, someone's gonna get someone's gonna get set on fire. And it ain't the owl keeper. Where is my owl? Ah, crying on cue. This paint mix I've been using for my uh, skin for the last two models suddenly is not cooperating for some reason. I think I'm going to have to start from scratch. working. I'm going to need just a touch more of the uh, Caucasian skin tone to finish this up because of how I've mixed it. <laughs> yes, yes. To total party kill and all of that horrible things. You don't need a total party kill when I'm around. Because I just roll like crap anyway. I will continuously roll. W whatever the critical fail is in whatever system, I will hit it at least once per session. If not multiple times per session. Including when it is st st statistically impossible 
to roll a fail more than twice, more than once at a time, I will roll it three times in a row. And I have done exactly that. I remember, uh, what system was it where you, it's a D100 system and you roll a critical on a, like one tenth of your, whatever the stat you're rolling against is. And then if you roll a critical, you get to roll again uh, to save it. Um, and on the save roll, I rolled a perfect one. It wasn't Shadowrun, because Shadowrun's a D6 system. It wasn't Call of Cthulhu, because Call of Cthulhu doesn't have a, set, a save for the critical fails. I've got so many game systems running around in my head. I have played, I have written so many game systems. Speaking of game systems, speaking of writing game systems, I need to come up with a jet bike racing, racing game because in the next few Realistically, months. Uh, I'm going to be painting at least three different for, from different companies jet bikes. Maybe four. Don't know. Um, and I'm going to force Paul, uh, that being Ratman, co-host of Back to the Brush podcast. I'm going to force him to, to paint one as well. And I'm also going to get, um, I don't think Amethyst Quill's involved, but I think uh, we'll get Mini Paint Stop. Uh, that, oh no. <laughs> I just paint, I was like, I'm going to start doing the non-metallic metal on the shell, and then I painted it with the skin tone. <laughs> I need the tan. But I don't need the... Uh, the Caucasian. So, what game system would you want to play if you could play any in our group as player or games master? I love games mastering, but I'm just crap at it. Like, I I have never been successful as a games master, so I'll I'll, I'll, pl I'll happily write a system and I'll write law for a game system. But it's best if uh, if I'm I'm not games master of any given session um kind of one without the fear of looming death at every at every corner it's kind of it, it's a little dull to be like oh yeah we're gonna die this session maybe that didn't work at all why did that not work Where's my, where's my magic non-metallic metal skills? Hmm, this doesn't look right at all. So the one difficulty here is that while the the, the entire rest of the model is the plastic stuff from uh, from Warlord Games, the shell itself is something that I've designed and 3D printed. Which, I mean, that's hardly a, a boast. It's such a simple part, but um, 3D printed stuff doesn't take to painting in the same ways as a smooth plastic piece does. Yeah, because that just looks awful.
One thing you certainly can't do is uh, is wet blending. Um, although that might just be because my, my printer is old and bad. Um, but the the micro texture that, that I get is enough that uh, wet blending just doesn't work. It, it soaks it up like a sponge. Yeah, just like that. That was awful. Let's try it again. See if I can glaze. Yeah, not really, not really. That's that's not coming in how I want it to. Uh, is Wrath and Glory the the replacement to Inquisitor? Where that where they did away with all the absolutely terrible rules for uh, for Inquisitor. Or was that Dark Heresy? That might have been Dark Heresy, actually. <sighs> this is... This is not working at all. if I've got too much of a uh, too much of a dark base coat because I need to go quite high uh, high value dark heresy right got it This is going from worse to worse. Oh, can't hurt to throw in some. Let's go in for some really dark. Yeah, I don't know if that helps. Um, Dark Heresy, which was, one of them uses the 40k stat line and is terrible, and one of them uses a modified version of the Inquisitor stat line, but it's so much better than Inquisitor was, which is a massive shame because... I kind of want to paint a 54 again. Yes, yes, you go and watch watch back to the brush. Strangely enough, I have played four campaigns of uh, Inquisitor. Oh, that almost works. That's so close to actually working. It's not quite there. I need to uh, grey up the projectile because that needs to. Uh, that needs to actually be a different colour. Because that needs to be a... Good question, what is the... Uh, the the anti-tank Soviet... Uh, this will be the... 33 millimetre?
So this won't be lead, but it is silver in color. That, just just doing that stripe across the top of the, uh, the projectile there, that's a better non-metallic metal than the last 10 minutes I've spent on, on the, the shell casing. Let's glaze in over that dark stripe. That was just pure water. I think it is the, the glazing is going to be working better than the wet blending, which I guess is an excuse to uh, get some practice at wet blending. So I have that glazing, sorry. Oh yeah, that works much better. Chimera Wargaming says good evening. Hello, how are you doing? We are we're just about finished with the stream, but I'm desperately trying to work out how to non-metallic metal on this shell casing. Um because it's 3D printed, my usual wet blending doesn't work. And so I'm having a little bit of struggle with it. So I'll probably give up, do some practice off stream, and, uh, and it'll be done for next time. One thing I will do before that is a separating dark line around the join between the uh, the projectile and the casing as long as I don't have too much water on the brush that is I mean, it's not absolutely terrible. It's bad, but it's not so utterly terrible that it's a, an utter failure. And that's so... <laughs> it's that I, I wish it was worse just so that I could call it a failure kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I'm just not as experienced painting, um, painting in this style on 3D printed surface. Because it is... It just has that micro texture that soaks up the the moisture and so paint paves slightly differently um, my wet blending doesn't work uh, yeah I'm gonna need to do some uh, some reference pictures L look up some reference pictures of, of brass things and work out where I've gone wrong let's get a We've got a glaze just in, just down that darker line. And I might just need to throw in a bit of red as well. Because at the moment I'm just using browns. I'm solidly in the middle of the color wheel, but. Yeah, everything's sort of... <laughs> like, I can just about see the effect that I'm going for, but it's just not quite there. Well, what I'll do is I'll give you five minutes to ask questions in the chat, and I'll answer them before uh, we close off the stream. I'm going to poke and prod at this uh, off-stream. I will... Uh, I will get it done. I've done. I've, I've done the other one. The um, the forty five, forty five, yeah. The forty five millimeter anti tank gun has slightly smaller casing, uh, slightly smaller ammunition. But I painted non metallic brass on that, and it worked. So I guess I'll look at that as well and see what I did differently this time that means that it hasn't worked. 
So, yeah, five minutes or a few more minutes. Ask some questions in the chat if you're interested in anything that I'm getting up to, uh, either about these models, this army, or some other stuff that I'm getting up to, including Back to the Brush podcast. Uh, there is a new episode out this week. Um, link in the description. There should be a link in the description to Back to the Brush. And also, uh, my Twitter, because I have a Twitter now. I don't know why I have Twitter. I almost certainly won't be using it very much. I barely use my Instagram. I'm probably just going to duplicate like anything I post on one, I'll post on the other until I learn the differences between them, because at the moment I don't really know how either of them are meant to be used. Oh, disaster. Strangely enough, because um, I was using a, a dark brown there for the eye, and I've used brown as the base coat for the skin, what I've effectively just done, instead of just smearing brown all over the face, what it's actually sort of done is just extra shadowing on, on the nose. I was going to be like, oh, I have to go and fix that now, but I actually don't. So this dude's got some eyes. He's got a uh, poorly painted shell. Otherwise, the model is speed painted. I, I'm, I'm not really worried about. I don't know how many times I've said this during the stream, but I'm not, I'm not kind of display painting this particular army. But let's have a look at the crew assembled on the gun. So the gunner sits in nicely there. The loader here will go in about there. And I need to paint a fourth member of the crew. But we also have the NCO sticking out of the front, in front of the gun shield. Mainly just because there's space there. Um, if I was to put the gun far enough forward that I could put four members behind then the barrel of the gun is sticking way off the base and I'd have to just have a really long base and I'm not really much of a fan of that so if I put it so that the gun is centered oh oh dropping everything go in go in stay yeah so if I put it so that the gun is centered there's enough space for three crew at the back um the two of them will have the bases recessed into the whatever texture paint I put on, uh, texture paste I put on the base, so they can be removable to indicate wounds during the game. Uh, there will be a uh, another guy at the back, which I haven't made yet, and then the officer can go off at the front. Are you raised up on something? No. Stop hovering around. But I'm not going to glue them down uh, or anything until I've got the texture paste uh, sorted. And given that I'm home making that, I want to have at least a few more models before I uh, I start doing that because I don't want to make a big batch and then just have it on one model. Although I can probably make a small batch enough for this. But I don't see any more questions in the, uh, the chat. So I will end the stream here. I have been successful. I've painted exactly what I wanted to. The crew for my Ziz-3 anti-tank gun. 
and so that's a pretty successful stream so thank you to everyone who's popped past i've seen a few names um unfortunately my participants uh, thing is empty again which is somewhat annoying even though i know that there are people watching uh, it says that there's <laughs> won't give me any of their names um but Chim uh, chimera wargaming carrick foxy Mitz certainly is recent uh, nicholas was here as well at the beginning and some others as well i just apologize for forgetting everyone um i'm edscar i have a whole bunch of links in the uh, description that show all of the things i'm getting up to uh, but for now we are done and i shall see you next week so thanks for watching and goodbye